musician Susan Rothberg is an orchestra educator and she is the conductor of the string orchestra for the youth orchestra of Palm Beach County. And then her co-presenter, Laura Sinclair, she's an active violin violist and a Suzuki studio teacher in the South Florida area. And she is a director of strings at Plamosa School of the Arts in Florida. So without any further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Susan Rodberg and Laura, Laura Sinclair. Hi, thank you so much, John, for the nice introduction. I'm also a full-time teacher at um, UB Kinsey Palm View Elementary School of the Arts, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to see our notes. There we go. Um, we're so excited for this opportunity. And thank you, Nat Kinkle Generation Hope, for funding this exciting and important event for string teachers worldwide. And thank you to all the attendees who are here and for joining us today. Um, as he said, my name is Susan Broadberg, and with me is my good friend and colleague, Laura Sinclair. And we would like to start today by telling you about our string program and how we ended the school year. And I need to share my screen. <laughs> Let's see here. So while Stu Susan's getting that pulled up, uh, hi, I'm Laura Sinclair, and I am the strings director at Plumosa School of the Arts in Delray Beach. It is currently a K through five uh, elementary magnet fine arts school, and it will be K through eight um, effective fall 2021. We have a student body of about 625 students, and I bring strings to the third through fifth graders. The K through two students are on an arts exploration wheel of eight fine arts areas for about 45 minutes a day. And um, my string students get an hour of strings education um, every other day. They choose two fine arts areas, studio areas to um, major in every year. They can change it every year if they'd like. And a little bit about how I deliver my program in the summer of 2019, John mentioned that I am also a Suzuki teacher. In summer of 2019, I attended Suzuki in the schools training. Hello to all my fellow Suzuki teachers out there. And I um, found it to be a really amazing way to marry what I love about Suzuki private teaching and what I love about classroom teaching. Um, so uh, the benefit being that I am mostly actually focusing on solo repertoire that um, and using um, bass lines and harmony parts to provide scaffolded instruction. Um, it, I also, part of the Suzuki philosophy that I really believe in is the concept of review to deliver great technique instruction, so we're never really done with a piece, and um, that it is a very positive learning environment, and there's always a great way to correct something. So um, in addition to my studio classes, my students also benefit from a mentorship program um, with Lynn University Conservatory of Music in Boca Raton. And those graduate students come in and give private lessons to my students. So 85% of my student body is under, uh, is in free and reduced lunch. We are really lucky to have a lot of in, um, one-to-one -one instruments for everyone on my campus, and um, it's uh, access for everyone, which is really nice. So Susan would love to tell you a little bit about how her program is different from mine. Well, thanks, Laura. Um, I, like I said, teach in um, an elementary school. It's a Title I Magnet Elementary School of the Arts near downtown West Palm Beach, Florida, and the school is actually located on the site of our historical, of the historical industrial high school, which was once the black high school founded in 1929. Um, our total student body is approximately 650 students. I teach the entire kindergarten and first grade violin class <laughs> for half a year. Um, second through fifth grade students take either strings or a keyboard as an elective on the wheel. And it's in second grade where they choose uh, what to play what which instrument um, I have instrumental technique class all year long once a week all year long um, six years ago we started a Venezuela Elsa Sema inspired music program 
That includes the entire music department. Specifically in strings, I picked the kindergartners who show the most interest and inherent physical and musical ability to be in that Vivaldi violin orchestra. And they, they do start on um, paper mache instruments that their families have to come in and make um, in a workshop. And so they've got a lot of investment already, the, the parents do. Um, um, in the following year, we invite more students to join us from that grade level. Uh, second and third grade students are in a weekly uh, strings technique class that can and they can also be in our next level El Sistema Orchestra which is called Beethoven Orchestra and that orchestra meets every day of the week which is pretty cool. Um, my fourth and fifth grade students are are together they come together in their and string technique classes so there's such a huge wide range of abilities I've had I have kids who are playing concertos in that class and kids that can't tell you which string is A and which string is D. So we, I, I just do individual, it's like a practice class and I go around and help everybody. Um, and then fourth and fifth grade students also have a specialty class. They can have either one or two. Um, they're called studios and the studios are classes like band and chorus and orchestra, dance. It's like every art since we're an art school. Um, I have two string studios. One of them is called the UBK Orchestra and the other is called the UBK Ensembles. Um, the, on, both of these groups tour the United States for festivals. Um, my students have been generously supported by string mentors from Lynn University Conservatory of Music and Boca Raton that has been such an important partnership. I can't tell you, such an important partnership. And like most of you, we were thrown into virtual learning back in March, um, Friday the 13th. Um, my experience um, is that it was 20 minutes before dismissal. And it was the week before spring break. And so I figured, okay, two weeks off, it's okay. So I ran around the school, got all those orchestra kids to, to come and get their best friend from the orchestra room so they could take their best friend home for the next two weeks. So Laura, I can't see your face. I'm so. Oh, sorry. I'm here. I know. <laughs> <laughs> like, I Susan, see like Susan, my my March 13th did not end how it started. I started in a meeting with my principal who said, "Oh, there's no way that we're going to close school. Our kids depend on school for everything: food, shelter, supervision, academics." Um, and by the end of the day, it was a very different thing. So I ended up with. Um, completely online until the end of May and had students, I had about 60% of instruments home. Um, our district, our, our school really tried to get as much technology into the hands of our Title I kids as they possibly could, but we ended up with about one device per family, not per student. Um, so, we know that now that in, in Palm Beach County, we are returning to online learning in the, in the fall. We've delayed uh, the start of the school year so that we can get more technology into the hands of our students and that the local internet providers can make the networks more robust so that they, we have connectivity for everyone, hopefully. Once we get to phase two, who knows when that will be, We'll, um, we're bringing our youngest to every campus. So K-1 will hop on, hop into our elementary campuses first in sixth grade in the middle schools and ninth in the, and then we, if, if things trend down, then we'll keep going. But, so Susan and I uh, wanted to reflect a little bit on our online learning experience from March till May and talk about what didn't work. Um, I'm sure that many of you had uh, a variety of experiences in what was uh, dictated to you through virtual learning. Uh, the school District of Palm Beach County used Google Classroom as the primary instruction source and any live meetings had to be held through um, Google Meet. The directions for my uh, campus were that live instructions, uh, live meetings were nice but not expected. And um, that attitude transferred to the students very quickly and attendance in live sessions were, was 
um, poor for some. I think um, ex accessibility is the first thing that I would talk about there um, in terms of not being able to one laptop and four kids is a is a problem. But um, what we did was um, I started for my first year kids, I started doing a practice club. And because I was already delivering Suzuki instruction, I was everyone in my first year knew the same songs. I hadn't haven't hadn't chosen different repertoire for different classes. And so we were able to get together and the kids were really hungry for that live music making experience and that connection. Um, we, um, and I was able to, because the kids were familiar with the repertoire, I was able to engage even the ones who didn't have their instruments. Um, but Susan had it teaches very differently than I do and had a different experience. So let's hear from her. Right. So I, um, I just really thought it was going to be temporary. So I just continued on what I was doing um, and then realized within a week that it wasn't going to work out. Realized after a day it wasn't going to work out, actually. Um, so I had only, take, I had only told the orchestra kids to take home their instruments, with which left kids in those technique classes without instruments. Um, so basically, we did a lot of music reading and a lot of rhythm practice. None of them were live meets, um, mostly because barely any of them were even in the classroom, in the Google Classroom. Um, I think that they were overwhelmed with um, the academic work that they had. Um, after a few weeks, they wanted, they started asking me on the classroom, when are we going to have live meets? So I started doing it, and I think the most I had show up was two kids for a whole week of live meets. Um, and then they would say on the classroom, oh, I'm so sorry, I missed it, I miss seeing you. And I'm like, well, then why didn't you come? So <laughs> um, the orchestra, the orchestra was different. My, my Beethoven orchestra kids missed me a lot um, and they wanted to have orchestra online. And so what I did was, um, since I have an artist in residence who was seeing them, he was making himself available for two hours, three days a week. And he was doing like private lessons and and um, not private, well, like group lessons with them. It was it was great. And so I knew that they were getting that, but they missed me as well. So we started doing breakfast with Beethoven every morning at 7.30. And I had like five, six kids every day. One day it was a couple, 10 or so. Um, it was adorable. We talked about music and we had fun. Um, but it was, again, these are going to be my orchestra kids next year. So I wanted to make sure I kept in, in touch with them. Um, the orchestra kids I had this year, we, they had already chosen their music. We were one week, literally one week away from traveling to a festival. And so they were done with that music, like done. <laughs> and they had chosen music for our spring concert. So we tried the online orchestra thing. And um, it, after a while, it got, you know, I'm sitting in this room by myself playing, and I can see them, but I can't hear them, and it was horrible. And, and so I think, I, I don't know, we had to change it. So um, our conversation, Laura and I had conversations with each other about this is crazy. And, and also towards the end of the year, um, we were thinking about our, Nat King Cole summer streams that that we do every year and how is this going to happen and we you know Shauna and all of us were talking together and and we just decided we can't do it I mean it's because of COVID and so um and I thought well let's let's move it to July maybe that'll be better so it wasn't better it was worse and so then we decided to do virtually and and I just went oh no not again <laughs> um so I had thought of this and, and um, I don't know if it was someone else's idea or if I thought of it myself, but thought about let's test out and talking with Laura, let's, let's see what a string, not a string, a song class would be like. So what if we just teach them songs? And Laura's like, yeah, that's what I do already. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we chose the, the repertoire. Laura can talk about our repertoire. It was great, actually. Repertoire. So we felt because we have our campers. So thank you, Nack and Cole. Our, we have been doing this camp for nine years now. 
and um, it's gone from one week to two weeks and it's a hundred kids and we take over Lynn University and it's it's a lot of crazy and we love it so much and it's the highlight of our kids year it's completely tuition free they um, they get to meet kids from other schools they get to see other kids who are playing instruments we have amazing guests it's really um, if you haven't seen any footage of that program you need to come you need to see it um, but the music I, this moment in our country made me really uncomfortable because I had not taught diverse music to my students and it was time to do it so we took this opportunity of having a song class to select music uh, we used um, adapted music from music by black by black composers from the Rachel Barton Pine Foundation and then we also went looking for Latin American folk songs and came up with a couple selections for every level of the rubric that um, that was great music and totally engaging for the kids and then we also presented them with the biographies of those composers so that they actually got the background and were able to make connections and understand the historical context of these pieces um, so the song classes were small group instruction but backed up with all of the asynchronous resources that Susan and I had had success with um, in Google Classroom. So Susan and I were madly making teaching videos, short content, just like Rebecca said, and uh, play along audio files, duet part audio file, video files, so that in the hopes of at the end of five days, they were able to offer a performance to grandma which was right. something they were very excited about. No one wants to play the bass part to Dragon Hunter for Grandma. <laughs> grandma would love it, but mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so t Susan, tell, us, tell the people what we know. So <laughs> what we know is um, for elementary at least, and I would, I would guess for older kids as well, um, I'm, I'm tossing out my orchestra plan and um, put, I'm replacing it with something better. It's not gonna be forever. Okay, so it's in the dusty cabinet. Not really, it's on my floor right here next to me. <laughs> um, so, ah, there we go. Um, what we see this, or, or this spot in time, is this incredible opportunity to do things that we couldn't do um, in real life and that we had lost, um, thought of I guess it would be the better thing um so I see you're on the next <laughs> so, so we see virtual learning as an opportunity to empower your student for self-paced learning um through a common sequence of repertoire that you have curated for your students that develop skills one by one um this offers an opportunity for them to have something in common with the other people in their class because we're all working on the same songs it offers you um material like stepwise scaffolded material that you can work through with your students and um it also because you're embracing and this is where my suzuki background really sh my heart my suzuki heart sings you never leave the piece behind so they're not worried about the notes anymore, so you can focus on the technique. Um, so in my classroom, my my video teaching looks a whole lot like my, my classroom teaching in that the live sessions are patterned around review and technique. Um, and there's a flow to it. So if a student wants to learn new stuff, it's happening closer to the end of class. I'm addressing that specific new technique that they might find in their new piece. And the online classroom component allows opportunities for listening and ear development and for self-discovery of the next piece. Or, um, you know, they learn so much from watching and now they have this video of you that they can watch over and over and over again. We will get to the community based, the community building part of it, but Susan's gonna talk about a little bit more about the repertoire selections. Yeah, so I I also have a Suzuki background. I, I actually taught at Capital University at Bexley, Ohio, which was a huge Suzuki program in the United States. Um, but once I started teaching at school, um, I used the 
philosophy, but not actually the music. Actually, I do use the music in our little Vivaldi orchestra. Um, and, but beyond that, um, I'm like, oh, well, I got to teach them to read too. So um, I am going to start including more diverse music um, from diverse backgrounds. They love, they love knowing, hey, my, my, my dad um, is from the Caribbean, you know, and so this composer is also, that's really cool. And um, it really opened their eyes. And so thank you, Laura, for that. Um, they, I was going to maybe take it a little further, have them maybe um, research. The older kids can re do some research on the composers or, or find out um, maybe why the song was written or what was happening in history at that time. Um, I'm a big history buff. Um, so I think that there's a way to personalize all of this instruction, even more so that it means so much to them and they'll remember it all their lives. Remember doing this. So in order to empower the cell, the motivated learner and the not so motivated learner, um, to learn new music and to break it down a little bit more, I would love to suggest that you teach your students a system to work through new music. So, because I'm working with students who are anywhere from eight to 11, I often, I introduce a, a rhythm language called Blue Jello by uh, Michiko Yurko. And this is all game-based music theory stuff that I found some of it translates really um, well to the online platform. And I use it often in our live meets, but my students have a rhythm syllable system for working through the rhythm. Then they also understand how to air bow. We air bow tons. And then we work through those rhythms and open strings and work measure by measure on the tough stuff. So in those live sessions, I'm also tackling, okay, so here's the next song that maybe some of you already know how to play. I often will play through it and then I'll highlight the work. Um, Cause you're not interested. If you're choosing a song that's entirely new material, it's too hard. You've got to give a little stepping stone, especially because everyone is home isolated and seeking community, you want to turn music into that positive experience for them. So um, Susan has a great plan for how we maximize that live instruction. Yeah, I was going to say, so now that we have our plan, we're going to have to maximize our live instruction. And it, it's a little more um, than you might think. Um, our kids are so used to um, watching us or watching videos and watching us, but they don't really know how to do it themselves. They think they do, but they don't. So um, <laughs> being on some of these calls with some of these kids at, um, last spring and at camp, I did, I've done two camps now. Um, make sure that they stage their space. You tell them, you have to say the words to them. Make sure that you are in a quiet room. So mom doesn't have the TV on in the next room or talking on her phone in a loud voice in the next room or in your room. Um, look in your camera. Don't turn around and look at your room. Look in your camera and see what you see in your room and make sure it's what you don't mind everybody else seeing that's in your room. Um, <laughs> the um, pets are a distraction but they're adorable. Um, so, so um, you know, I my dog barks at every dog that barks online. And it was funny when I figured that out. But, and, and again, the distraction, you know, just make sure that they're in a room without distraction, distractions. Um, and it's something that they want. This is the internet. It's something they want on the internet. So, Lori, do you have any other ideas? So, I... Um really like to be able to see my kids well when I'm giving them instruction. Um, so we had, I made a little video that is easy. You can make one of your own, or I'm happy to send this one to you. That will help you s instruct your students on how to set up their space for online learning. Okay. You ready for it? Play. <laughs> Let me 
me show you how to set up your instrument so that your instructor can see you. This is not fun. This is not good. This is perfect because I can see both my right hand and my left hand, and I am filling up most of the computer screen so that my instructor can also see me. So I, I made this because um, I knew they would watch it. They, the kids miss you and, um, and they, and they want to, they, they want to interact with you and it's good to make them smile. Um, know that not everyone's going to turn their camera on. There's lots of reasons why. So, uh, find out privately. Don't try to shame them into it in a live meet. Um, the other thing I think that they really value is a lesson structure and you i'm sure you all find this in your in person you remember what we taught in person uh, in your in person teaching as well um that the flow and a routine is really is really important at this point so they they know that you're going to get to that repertoire that they know and that they feel a little bit more confident on this time um it's important that you address address them and start to keep them engaged intellectually, musically, socially, and emotionally. It's also okay for you to show them that you're human, that you're gonna make mistakes, and that your lesson plan may get derailed from time to time by a completely out of tune D-string, internet connectivity, um, dogs barking, whatever it is. That being said, when you D, I want you to, I think I'm a huge advocate for the routine. When you deviate from the routine, make it really special and make it like a big party in your class so that they really have something to look forward to. I often, like Fridays, will typically be like note reading games and bingo in my classes. Um, and I have found ways to keep that going online and I encourage you to find that one thing that they can look forward to. But Susan has a great bag of tricks. <laughs> right, so, so um, if you're like me, I know how to read my kids, my, my, my students. I know, I know them pretty well because um, I've had them since they were in kindergarten. And um, I can tell when a lesson is tanking. <laughs> I can tell when they're excited and they want to keep playing. Um, and so as a teacher, I have a pretty big bag of tricks that I can just off the top of my head, I'll say something to them or whatever. I'll think of it at the moment of time, and I'm really good at at doing that, I'm, but I'm not so good at doing that um, online. <laughs> so um, in that case, I do. I started making a bag of tricks. It's my bag of tricks. Um, so uh, name that tune, okay? So we're playing a couple of different songs. What song am I playing now? And they're like, wait, what? And they'll they'll start paying attention. Um, there's a lot of videos and I gotta caution you that if you're gonna show a video make sure you use um, the safe YouTube link which we put in our in our document that you're gonna get after the webinar um, so that there's not extra stuff on there and the kids are clicking through things that they probably shouldn't be clicking through <laughs> but um, but to show videos there's there's a lot of really cool things that 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 I came up with and another teacher that we know came up with um, have, how about um, show your pets, you know? So they love the pets, they love every, everything. They love to see what you have. Um, you can do a scavenger hunt with colors, textures. It doesn't have to be about music, but it, it's fun if it is. Um, freeze dance, have somebody, have somebody play the song that they won't play for you um, anyway. But okay, let's play freeze dance with D string, you know, tango or whatever it is we're playing and um, so they get to be the, the person that stops the music, you know? So now they're, now you're practicing with a game. Um, you can also do a, like a show and tell with a the theme. So there, there's a lot of different things you can do. I mean, most of it, I just asked YouTube, hey, what's a good thing to do with kids online? Um, so make a big bag of tricks. <laughs> there we go. Um, I got it. I've got this open in two different places. I'm so sorry. Please hold it. There we go. So, um, like I was saying before, kids are used to watching videos. Um, and it's just like music on the radio and, and live music. They, 
they don't they don't get it that you're not supposed to just blurt stuff out when you're in an, in an audience in live music. And same thing when you're teaching online. Sometimes they think that what you're watching right now is a video. And it's okay to, um, with your camera on, maybe do something you shouldn't do. <laughs> um, or eat with your camera on while everyone else is watching. So, um, you've got to be careful. By the way, I cannot see any of you. I've lost my Zoom, my Zoom window. <laughs> um, so you've got to you've got to make sure that they understand that you're real. And and I I I was laughing when I came up with this slide because how, how many times now raise your hand? How many times has a kid asked you, "Aren't we supposed to be done now?" Right? I have. Yeah. So um, make sure also um, that they know they're not going to don't expect them to be magically engaged in what you're doing um, they they do have kind of that entertainment thing because then they're used to instant entertainment um, so instead of making it entertaining make it engaging is the word that i want to say um, make sure that your kids are being um, digital citizens so um and make sure they understand that what they put on the internet stays on the internet you know i've had a couple kids put things in google classroom and of course i get the notification and i'm like what did they just say to me and i go to the classroom and it, and of course they've deleted it and so i've had to um call parents <laughs> and say hey just an FYI, I think your child might, might be frustrated about something and this is what they did, you know, please talk with them. Um, so uh, don't be afraid to, to um, you know, acknowledge that sort of thing. Um, in, in large classes, raise your hand. And it's so adorable when they're all raising their hand like this. It's like, you've got a thing to raise your hand for you, virtual hand. Um, and um, make sure they keep off their mic. And... Um, and keep their camera on or off if you're going to leave your camera you should probably turn it off so um and laura um had another thing to say too so um i just wanted to back up what susan was saying that you start to build this camaraderie with them um the internet as we all know as adults the internet allows us gives us permission to say a lot of things that we would never say in person and so i think that's a in this moment, this is a really important lesson that we can teach our students online and really moderate all forums that they're interacting with, whether it's the chat in your live meets or through Google Classroom and um, asking them to use a little bit of um, decorum, be kind. Be ki I, we want kind citizen musicians, um, which leads us to our next uh, bag of tricks, which is the asynchronous learning. So there's lots of reasons why our learners might not be able to access us as we would like to. Um, ideally, we want them live because we can interact with them. They miss us. We miss them. Um, you can see and fix those problems immediately, hopefully, if they've watched my Zoom video. Um, and um, but it's just not possible. There's accessibility issues, there's connectivity issues, there's how many kids in the house have a laptop that they can use, and who, our kids are little, uh, small enough that, who's helping them out with their internet, like, and their computer usage? Some of them are really, really great on tablets and really terrible within Google Classroom. So, it, there's a lot of factors involved, and so attendance of a live meet is ideal, but shouldn't be a, a deal breaker for any of us and shouldn't be a deal breaker for those kids. So you have to find a way to include the kids who can't be there. Right. So you can't just record your session and send it to them is, is one thing I figured out. Um, they, they, you can record them, but there needs to be something along with that from you um, to include them in the, session even though they weren't there so um leave them leave them a google form and and if you need help making google forms they're not just quizzes by the way um leave them a um a slide 
slideshow uh, slide presentation. This is this is Google Slides, what we're in right now. Um, you can do some pretty cool things. Um, leave, leave them audio tracks to practice with. Ooh, why don't you make your own audio track along with my audio track and record that one. Oh, that's a great idea, Mrs. Rodberg. <laughs> I'll do that. I mean, it doesn't work out very well, but still, they're, they're excited about that sort of thing. So I built in some accountability into my own Google Classroom by taking some of those resources and turning into an interactive practice chart. I feel like practice charts are kind of like, oh, I roll my eyes when I say the word practice chart. <laughs> but um, it is a great way to, whether they, whether they track anything, it's more an organized way of you to deliver what you expect them to be working on during the week with all the videos and audio files that you've created. I personally will create all of my videos. I mostly record them in Zoom, honestly, for the reasons that Rebecca mentioned, because they're low bandwidth, they can watch them on the phone and they are quick and easy things for the kids to interact interact with that they can that will load easily on their whatever device they're using to access your Google Classroom. Um, the thing that I did not build into my practice charts was um, product. I do ideal that that was recording video and sending me audio files and video files were a separate thing. I just really wanted to find a way for them to engage with the resources that I had on the classroom. Susan has a great way of using Google Slides um, as, a, as a means of instruction and assessment. Right, so you can, you can actually go through a whole thing in Google Slides and, and find it, and then they, they answer a couple questions, and if, it, if they don't get the right answer, it can, you can actually make the slide send you back um, to something else. Same with Google um, Form. I think I'm talking about Google Form that you can send it back, that can loop around and, and, and help the kids with it. Or, or it can be like, this is the order that we're gonna do. Um, the good thing about Google, Google Form is that it'll go into a spreadsheet and you can see how they did. Um, Google Slides, again, you know, they can, you can send them a Google Slide um, thing for them only and they can add their own slides to it. So, um, anyway, <laughs> the um, Jamboard, which is this little guy down here. I don't know if you can see what I'm pointing at, but it's it's a cool thing too that where they can interact with each other. So we love to, building upon what Rebecca mentioned in the last hour, building community in your online, your synchronous and asynchronous learning is like key to what comes after this. So I, in my live meets, I often will mute myself. Everyone is muted except me typically, but I often will have mute myself and have my students lead it. Involve the kids who don't have instruments. I had one kid in my um, practice club. He was sitting in his mom's break room three days a week and showed up every single time. That kid deserves to be engaged some way. And he was calling note names and uh, for scales. He was 100% there and you have to give him something to do even if there's no instrument in his hands. It's important to also provide opportunities for sharing, both musical and personal, um, and know that it's not wasted time. It's investing in that future ensemble family that you're creating for those kids. And when they come back into your orchestra room, they're gonna feel like they already know all these people, even if they're strangers at first. Right, and, in, and then in Google Classroom um, on the stream, it's, it's, you know, they can share their triumphs. You know, look what I made. I, had one child who had made, um, had written Mario with, with harmony, <laughs> the Mario thing with harmony. There's a third grader and he shared it on the stream of Google Classroom. That was one of our Breakfast the Beethoven um, kids. Third grader, I was, I was impressed. So um, uh, that was on Google, that no, was it Chrome Music Lab, Chrome Music yes. Lab. Um, I love it. And that has a, that, that one has a lot of different apps that have a share capability. The right. kids love, they may never post a, a playing video, but they will love to share their compositions with you. Exactly. Um, I know Rebecca was talking about how to let them introduce your, introduce themselves. Um, we, we, or I have been to so many webinars, but I 
have been using a thing called Kahoot for quite a while, and um, the kids do not have to be 13 years old to, to log into Kahoot. A lot of them, a lot of the other things, they have to be 13, and some of them won't lie to do it, and that's fine. Don't lie. Um, but you can make a selfie on Kahoot and then share it with your class. And, and um, actually, if you look on Kahoot's website, there is a template now um, to make a selfie for kids. And it's just things like, you know, let me introduce myself. I, what I'm the most passionate about is what my pets are, you know, and, and I have how many brothers and sisters. And the idea is, is they don't share pictures of themselves, or they can, or they can look in the image library and, and put a picture that gives you a clue to what the answer is. And they all love to play Kahoot. So you might have to help them the first time, but they all love to play it and they figure it out because they want to do it so, so much. Um, so, and also in Google Classroom, you can model. This is where you can model how to give back appropriate feedback on videos or comments that they make. Um, and I, it's, there's so much more to it than just putting assignments on, which you probably will get back blank anyway. So, <laughs> um, all right, so. So we've our... got another slide of great resources that you'll find when we send out the Google slide. John's sending out a PDF of all the Google slides. Um, many you've probably already engaged with, so we don't want to um, take up your time on that. There's a positive side to this. Right. So the sunny side up. <laughs> um, so definitely, like I said before, this is this is such a historical moment. Um, and instead of going, oh, I miss doing this, I miss doing that. Look at all the other things that you can do. And when the kids are, oh, I miss you so much, I'm right here. Look, here I am. Be with me. Come to the meets and, and you, you can talk to me. Um, the, uh, I've got an idea of what I'm going to do. Um, who knows when we're going to be li live? We, I mean, we've got, e we haven't even gotten to phase two yet in our county. Um, so my idea is to take the song class, take the diverse music that they're learning and to maybe, like I said, have them research some of these composers. Wouldn't it be so cool if some of these composers who are still alive, they could write a letter to or, or find you know, write an email to them and, and, you know, find out about them or, or just tell them what they're doing. Wouldn't it be cool if they took one of these songs um, and, and the theme of the song, a folk song, and made a variation to it? What a cool thing, right? So I think that's what our ending event is. Instead of having a concert, we're going to have an event where we, you know, we can't have a concert anyway. And if we can play um, in a room, we can't have a audience so the audience is going to be online no matter what we do and that's my plan at least until january i don't know what i'm going to do after that i'll no no i i'll figure it out <laughs> so the beauty of what susan and i have offered today is that you can transition this really easily to blended teaching because that you've already established this library of resources for them asynchronously your meat is not your live meeting doesn't necessarily change. You can continue with the song class model and then deepen it by teaching bass lines and harmony. And then maybe you can send home some orchestra parts. But what I think this is a great moment for us to teach solo music to our kids so they can take home and own it and share it with their families because there's such a, a, such a greater chance of them playing a one person concert for their family than for us to be able to share our music all yeah, together listen. in one room. Um, so own it. Um, right. Susan, I have a surprise for you. What? We have a video from camp that, that Victor would what? like to share. All right, so I'll stop sharing. Here we go. Oh, there's everybody. I missed you all. I'm so <laughs> happy to see you. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Pulse. What's an example of pulse? Something that you feel every day. Can everyone find their heartbeat? So we're going to say the word blue for the quarter notes. Ready? Go. Blue, 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 blue. Can everyone try that with me a couple times? Rest, rest. Jello, rest. Jello. 
Remember, notes make sound. Very good. How did it go for everyone? Feel good? Yes, thumbs up? Perfect. <laughs> I'm going to show one more time. But really the scale is so that you know what path your fingers go on when you play a song in that key. Okay? That's what they're for. So, um, all right. And then I see that the time signature of this song is 6-8. Okay, Aria, on the C string and the G string, you're playing third fingers, which is good. On the D string and the A string, you're going to play two. Second finger, okay? All right, Austin, your turn. What about this part? time. Here we go. We press this button here and let's follow Twinkle Twinkle. Well, yeah, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm so amazed by how many students are here right now. questions actually one of the big a, a lot of people have been asking for your list of pieces Ooh. of your diverse pieces um, they're wondering if you want to add a list to the sure, absolutely yeah that, that would be great and then a lot of people have been asking me is this being recorded where's everything will be shared yes it's being recorded and we'll we'll email everyone that registered where everything will be posted but it's going to be somewhere on the Nat King Cole Generation Hope web website um, let's see, another question is, Laura, what kind of rhythm system did you say that you use? It's, um, it's called Blue Jello. It's from a music, the a game-based music theory system called Music Mind Games by Michiko Yurko. I believe she teaches in the DC area and she offers like teacher trainings. Um, she also has a, a huge database of game videos, a video, um, database of how to play all of her games, which I encourage you to check out. Yeah, uh, another question was, what are the note naming, note reading games you do do on what? I, I forget how it was in the context of why you were talking about bags and tricks. Yes, so the note reading games that I, that I played, um, mostly I made myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> I put some in Kahoot. And I, I put some in Google Form, I put some in slides. I did, I did one where I was just like clapping. I, I had my, my iPad on my lap and my computer over here and I was clapping rhythms. And then I'd show them different rhythms and which one was that? And they were like, oh, oh I know. They, they were just so excited to interact with me. So what the two that came. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Someone, uh, someone else just sent me Laura, Laura, about the, the spelling of the person's name. Oh, oh here, I'll, I will message it to you. Um, I was also going to say that if, if you're lucky enough to have a district that lets you use Zoom, um, I share my iPad directly with the as a screen share, and you any of those fun note reading apps, like I love Flashnote Derby. Yes, Flashnote Derby 
allows you to display multiple clefs and select whatever notes you want and really curate it to the level of the student. And it's, um, if you are lucky enough to be able to use Zoom for your online teaching, it's, uh, it's a fantastic resource and the kids love it. So anything, I, do, I feel like a lot of the technology that I use is not anything different than what I use in my classroom. Musictheory.net I also use as note reading and that's web-based so you can use it in Google Meet as well. Yeah, um, hey, maybe you can answer this for Victor. The last group, was that Sons of Maestro that was at the end of that video? It was Sons of Maestro. Yeah, for those of you that's been asking who was that group at the end, that's Sons of Maestro. And the, at the end of this conference on Friday, they're actually going to be doing a performance for us right after, what, what sessions do I have before Friday? Right after Frank Diaz, who will be speaking on mindfulness and wellness. So here's another big question, and I kind of have, I'd kind of like to ask this too. And if Rebecca, if you're still there, please feel free to chime in. Everyone has been asking about tuning. How do you teach tuning? How do you teach tuning to beginners? Like, how, how are you going to go make sure that the students' instruments are tuned to begin with? Well, I think the first thing that they need to be able to, to um, figure out um, is if it's too high or too low. And so we do do a lot of, of singing because if they if they're just going to start turning things, then it's not going to work out. Um, we do have a local, um, well, local and not so local, I guess, depending on where you live in the county. It's a huge county um, um, person who will a, a luthier shop who will tune them for for free um, and. I have varying degrees of success getting the kids to use their pegs. Um, I have an idea that I'm going to try, so I'm not going to tell you what it is until I find out if it's successful or not. So, um, for myself, I shared to Lisa Morris, who's a string teacher. I forget where she is, but she made these amazing videos. Is she with near you, Rebecca? Elena, yeah. Her I think tuning videos are excellent everyone just don't make a tuning video post leases we'll share those as a resource too they are really great <laughs> um and i have only had three broken strings so far and you spell that out for me uh lisa morris i'll put it in the chat for you we can add it to the list too on the bottom there yes all right sounds good and Rebecca, did you have anything to add about tuning? Um, not, not really. I, I have always done an, uh, kind of an ear only approach, but my plan this fall is to go ahead and ask my students to have the app on their phone or, or, or whatever it is so they, that we'll do some ear training things and singing things online. But when they go to tune uh, for the first couple times, I am going to have them double check to try to eliminate breaking strings as much as I can. What I did in the spring when kids would break their strings, <laughs> um, we would actually meet with them one-on-one -on -one and, and literally help them tune over Zoom together. And it worked out. They just needed a lot of coaching. So the more students you have, I think the harder that is. I was speaking with a string teacher this morning who actually is gonna have extra instruments available because the nature of what's happening is some of our enrollments are going to go down some are going to like a lot is happening to us but he is going to have some extra string instruments so his plan actually was instead of constantly trade you know grabbing kids instruments because they're face to face he's gonna if their instrument goes out of tune just hand them a new instrument take their instrument away allow the virus to you know expire tune it back up and and basically instead of tuning each kids just have a backup in tune instrument to give them you know, I think it's going to be challenging, but I, my plan is to teach them to tune like as soon as I can. And if they're too little, I think I'm going to teach their sibling or their parent. <laughs> and in my community, a lot of the kids, they their whole family study string instruments. If the oldest does it, they all do it. And so I actually have a ton of family units where the older kid is going to be able to provide a lot of that support, I think, with just some mentoring from us. And another thing is there was a string teacher townhouse last week by 
uh, Sue Han and David McCoke were at Baldwin Wallace, and Anna Radspinner Spinner was on that town hall session, and she mentioned that she was going to have appointments with parents or like meetings with parents and teach the parents how to tune the instruments. Now, if that will apply, if that will be successful in your school district, I'm not sure, but getting the parents involved and training them to teach the instruments so they can tune the instruments so that they could better, uh, so that the instruments are better more in tune without the possibility of breaking, that would be totally beneficial too. Uh, some other questions, I think we have time for one more. Uh, programs to create the videos. Someone asked Laura how she created her videos online and someone asked Rebecca even before how you made the blues. So Laura, you go first. Uh, that video was um, my little Zoom instructional video I made in iMovie and um, my low bandwidth videos. I open up a Zoom meeting, I hit record and I knock them out. Hit stop, record the next one. Hit stop, record the next one. All right, Rebecca. Um, I, two sources for video. One is just my iPhone and iMovie. The other one, um, my grad graduate student, uh, experienced teacher Heather Loftal is on this call right now. She's actually my video production. Yeah, hi Heather. She did all the video productions and will be doing them for our diverse online music community. And she uses Reaper for the audio, which is open source, it's free, that's why I'm mentioning it, and DaVinci uh, for the video. And hopefully she'll text me if I got any of this wrong. But I have to tell everyone that those, the Open String Blues videos, they're time intensive. Oh, Reaper, she is texting me. Reaper's not open source. Um, Heather, do you know what the cost is on that? Uh, $60. Okay, so Reaper is the audio and uh, Da Vinci. It's, so anytime you have to put together multiple tracks, you're looking at kind of hours of production and work and realigning the timing of it. So we had to do a scratch track and everything like that. Um, but DaVinci is free, she's letting me know. I, iMovie, if you have a Mac, is is available, and there's a lot of open source. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, I, I put together a virtual ensemble in the in the spring, too, and oh my goodness, I don't know if I ever want to do that again. That's a lot of, a lot, a lot of time. Work. Well, anyhow, uh, we're, we're, we're out of time, and uh, before we conclude for the day, I wanted to thank you, the audience, our, our string teachers, our colleagues and friends for tuning in today. And I hope that you learned uh, you, you learned something or you had something that you could take away to your students. And I, I wish you good luck in the fall as we start to begin the school year. A few reminders, and we'll send up a follow email about handouts and recordings after our three-day conference is over. Additionally, we will be sending completion certificates for those that attended the sessions, um, and that will be distributed in the next next week or so. Some of the questions that we didn't get to, I will email them to Laura, Susan, Rebecca, and they'll go ahead and answer them, and we'll put them online as well. Tomorrow, we're, we have, I'm, I'm excited for tomorrow too. I mean, this is all going to be great. Tomorrow we have William Harris Lee of oh, William Harris Lee Violins. Who's going to present on? Oh, hello. And we have Manuel Capote, who's going to talk about mentorship in Title One schools. He and I actually talked about this yesterday, and I, a lot of it will apply to any string program, whether or not you're in a Title One school or an affluent school. And then Jason Gerard, who's in Florida, he will be talking about how to support students in, of color. Friday, I'm also excited for Friday, we have Charles Laux, who's going to talk about independent practicers online. Frank Diaz, who's going to talk about developing wellness and mindfulness as, you know, I was thinking about how we're just coping in this particular situation. It's important for us to not forget about ourselves because if we're not coping well, then we are not able to do our jobs very well, which is why I really wanted to bring Frank to talk about that. And then the the short video that you showed er that you saw earlier at the very end of that short video was the Sons of Maestro who will be putting up together a short uh, con concert for us. So again, thank you very much for being here and thank you for ver very much supporting us. Nat King, Cold Generation Hope, thank you very much for helping us put this together. I think it's really helpful for our colleagues. So with that said, class dismissed. <laughs>